Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jodie Bruff. I'm a partner and Sydney office head of SEC Newgate. Uh, and uh, we've been involved with, um, with the committee really since its inception, and we're always proud to, to be very involved with it. Um, thank you to Peter, Natalie, uh, Ian, uh, Lindy and Maha for that very generous and thought-provoking discussion. Uh, there were a number of points which particularly resonated with me. I think especially the point being made about where the jobs are. Obviously, um, Western Sydney Airport and the surrounding area now provide a litmus test for whether um, the city can supercharge the move of jobs to the west that are high value and attractive to people. Uh, obviously, when you look at uh, Parramatta, where the uh, Peter Shergold building will soon be, uh, be, be under construction. Uh, that's a place which has had a very long gestation. If you think back to the, to the 70s when uh, Laurie Brereton uh, caused uh, outrage by insisting that uh, Western Sydney should have a higher uh, share of health resources in Sydney, uh, very much like the, the powerhouse debate which was referred to. These things have a long gestation, but let's hope that uh, the airport and other projects speed it along. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to be introducing our next speaker. Um, as a business, it um, has a majority female um, uh, group of employees and also majority uh, female partners. We are acutely aware of the importance and value of diversity participation and productivity go hand in hand, and Australia's working women are productivity gold. Our prime age female labour source uh, force is the most highly educated in the OECD. They have a lot to contribute to society and to our economy. And yet the pandemic has been hard for working women, I think we all know that, because many of them carry an extra load, that physical and mental load of caring, as well as household work as well as their job. So how do we get better at harnessing the capacity of everyone? Uh, please welcome to the stage Professor Ray Cooper from the University of Sydney's Business School, who will tell us more about the problem and possible solutions. Ray is the director of the newly formed University of Sydney Gender Equality in Working Life Research Initiative, and is co-director of the Women, Work and Leadership Research Group. Thank you. Thank you, Jody, for that lovely introduction. Um, can I, before I start, um, acknowledge traditional owners? Um, it's rare in the last two years that I've actually left the land of the Gadigal people. I live um, in a city, Sydney, and so once again, I'd like to acknowledge uh, elders past and present um, and thank them for their custodianship. Um, can I also acknowledge the committee uh, and your leadership for making a space for conversations like this. Uh, it's really heartening to see um, work like ours put front and centre in such an important place, in such an important organisation. So kudos to the leadership of the committee for inviting me to come along. Kudos also to the uh, Treasurer for singing off my song sheet, which I, or I'm singing off his, uh, this morning with his contribution. And I've got to say, it's music to my ears to hear uh, a senior leader in the state talking about an interest in trying to build uh, participation and productivity through a focus on gender equality. So if you look in the, um, the printed um, agenda for today, you'll notice that my title has a slightly more depressing uh, title than it appears here. So we're going to go with this. Uh, it's from weary to whiplashed in your printed paper, but I thought that was probably a little bit too dreary. So why don't we go with from weary and whiplashed lashed to participating and productive. Um, and this is a really important thing for us to think about right now as we're looking at uh, building back better and not just building back better, but building back fairer. Now, I think what I'll talk to you about today, um, Will, is something of a sort of positivity sandwich, if you like. So starting with the good news, going into the middle with some of the uh, challenges that we've faced and then hopefully returning to some of the good news. Um, so get ready for that journey. Okay. Now, Jodie's already uh, touched on this, actually. Um, Australian women, prime age female labour force in Australia, is the most highly educated and skilled in the OECD. And that is productivity gold. 
Um, that is something um, that we should be very, very proud of. For those of us, there's a number of colleagues here from uh, education and higher education. Those of us who work in those sectors are incredibly um, proud of the changes that we've seen in just a generation in terms of women's participation. Um, if you look at this, uh, the graph here, you'll notice that in the year roundabout when I started university, um, it was only 12% of women in that young prime age uh, stage of life. 25 to 30, 12% in 1991 um, had a bachelor's degree. And look at the figure now. In, in 2021, on the latest data, 50% of young women uh, in the absolute prime, just hitting their straps, just out of, uh, you know, for, starting to forge their careers, half of that labour force um, are bachelors qualified. Um, and that is, you know, really quite a story to tell, and it's quite different to many other OECD economies. So at the moment, women are the best educated in the world. We are better educated than at any point in our history, and actually we're better educated than men. So women's share of bachelor... <laughs> uh, this is the good news. Um, women's share of the bachelor educated uh, labour force um, is larger than men's share. Um, also some work that we've been doing, um, partly in answer to what we saw as a, quite an ossified debate about the future of work, where we saw that it was mostly about robots and mostly about men's jobs. Um, my team at the University of Sydney have been working on a project called Australian Women's Working Futures, where we've talked to young women about what they have in work and what they want in their own future of work and their future career. Um, and we know from that research, which I'll talk about just a little, that they are educated on purpose, they, are, uh, they have ambition, and they seek to have a really long career. So they're not assuming that they're going to do this education and not get a return. They're assuming that they're going to get a return and they're going to be able to do that at the same time as doing other really important things, like having a family. OK. Um, but there's been a fundamental shift in women's participation over the last 30 or 40 years. Now, this one's a hard one to explain, but it's really important that we take a, a variegated view of women's uh, participation in the labour force. I think a, a number of contributions have noted that already. So what this shows is over the life course, so from 15 to 85, what are the participation uh, rates of women in working life? Um, and, and then, yeah, so what is their share? And what you'll see um, is that they, it's over four time periods. To cut it down a little bit, let's just go with the bottom one and the top one. So the bottom one is 1966, if my poor bifocals can see that far. Um, and that really says that in 1966, women enter and peak in their labour market participation early, and that's at around about the same point that um, the first child emerges in a family. So the early 20s, it peaks, it dips, and it doesn't ever really recover. So if you like, that's my mother's generation, uh, and that's the classic story of women of that generation. Um, you'll notice the next two time periods, uh, 1980 and 2000, you still have that quite pronounced dip. The labour market economists call that Nappy Valley. So that's where we go, women leave the labour force to go and take on family responsibilities. Um, and often, you know, come, come back up, but it falls away after about 10 years in the labour force. Look at last year, 2020, 2021. Basically, we do not have that Nappy Valley. It's disappeared, it's a plateau. So women are they're at the peak of labour force participation is actually at around about the time of the birth of the first child in the early 30s. It actually goes up later in the, uh, in the working life. And then if you'll see, and this is something that happens with men as well, it pushes out into later years. So there's a fundamental sh uh, change in the shape of women's labour force participation. That's interesting. Let's look at this. This is men compared to women. The bottom two are women, the top two are men. Now, one thing I'll note there is that the classic bell curve, uh, women are looking more like men in terms of labour force participation. Um, and men haven't changed. And now, one of the reasons that I would put weary into my um, title there is that that does make women a little bit tired because we're not seeing much change in what men are doing in the labour force, but women are really pushing. We haven't seen generational change like this in the provision of care and other regimes around, around work. Okay. So I think that's all good news. Women are educating, they're doing what we've told them to do, they're participating more, and they're really uh, you know, coming and thriving in the labour force or trying to. We also know, anyone who's taken a look at the shape of sectors and jobs over the last 20 years knows that 
the uh, services sector has really grown. It's the powerhouse of the economy. Um, in, in Australia, we actually are the most uh, exposed to the service sector economy in the OECD, apart from Singapore. Um, and we know that the growth in that job, those jobs has actually been fuelled by some particular areas, one of which is in um, health and human services. And partly that reflects demographics around our ageing population and the need to provide service to them. Um, and it's also in growth in areas like education. Um, from that graph, um, this is just showing what projected growth is going to look like in the next uh, period to 2025, as projected by the National Skills Commission. But it's the same as data that uh, the Productivity Commission or any other source would give you, that the hero sectors are going to be in the service sector, and that of the top five, four of them are highly feminised. So uh, women are really participating. Uh, the jobs in which women are participating are growing, and they will be growing. OK, so what do women want? Before the pandemic, um, we asked women in a national representative survey, what did they value most for a future career? How would they thrive? And these are the top five priorities that they gave us. They want a good and a secure job, so they want employment security. And they want that, uh, if you see number three there, coupled with flexibility. So they don't want flexibility that doesn't involve also security. So it's kind of like a flex security um, type of thing that they're after. They want pay that reflects their value and their investment in their own education. That's really critical for them. Uh, they want care infrastructure that works for them, and they very strongly tell us in focus groups it is not working for them at the moment. And they want respect. It's hard not to labour that point at the moment when it's been on the front pages of our papers and stories across many different sectors over the last, um, well, Two years, I suppose, it's been on the front pages of the paper, both in stories in relation to politics, but also in relation to some of our major sectors. Um, OK, that was pre-COVID. Pre um, little plug here for the research. We're doing Mark II later in the year, looking for partners. Um, and we've just, been par we've just been funded by the Australian Research Council to run uh, our survey again. Uh, but if anyone's interested in um, a little focus on your particular sector, do call. Um, OK, but despite those enormous um, changes and opportunities, um, what do we know is going on more broadly? Um, so women still face significant gaps in pay and in superannuation, in occupational and industry segregation. Um, there is a really strong theme of undervaluation of feminised work. Um, career opportunities are not as available to young women even though they're our highly educated part of our labour force in the way that they are to young men, and we've got challenges in respect and voice at work. What happened in COVID was really a perfect storm that exacerbated all of that. Um, so we know from looking at uh, the um, front line of the COVID period that it looked quite different to the front line of the, the bushfire summers, for example. So we've got a distinctly feminised front line where we have um, workers in health um, and in ancillary support, but also workers working in retail um, and education and care who've been keeping the rest of us working, keeping us as safe as we possibly can be. And yet we know that those jobs are enormously undervalued um, and enormously um, low paid. Um, the lost jobs and hours, um, this was um, spoken about by the Treasurer this morning. Um, we know that this has been a feminised recession and this marks, well, not really a recession, a feminised uh, shock in the labour force. Um, most of the jobs and most of the hours that have been lost during um, the two quite significant uh, periods um, of lockdown in particular have been women's jobs, and in particular they've been young women's jobs. Now that's a problem now, but it's a problem longer term in terms of um, scarring and the impact on um, retirement savings. Women have been shouldering even more of the burden at home. So it is true um, that men did more work um, at home in the unpaid and caring work um, during the two COVID uh, lockdowns, um, but they stepped in behind women. So we were in a situation where women were doing this much unpaid work prior, men were doing this much, men stepped up, but women are up here. So the gap in unpaid work has actually increased during the period of COVID. 
which is interesting in homes and something we should consider, but it also impacts on the capacity of people to participate in equal ways in the labour market. And then we also have a shadow pandemic that's going on. Um, and my great colleague Ian, who I can't see in the bright lights, um, Ian Hickey and others have been looking at the ways in which women's mental health and wellbeing has declined and declined more than has men's during the, the pandemic. Um, and we've also seen increases in things such as domestic and family violence um, and a range of other um, challenges. So that's not great. Um, now, the whiplash in my title comes from this graph. And th what this graphs uh, for you is the, p the big periods of uh, shock that hit the labour market in Australia. At the top, you have Australia, and at the bottom, uh, you have uh, New South Wales. And what you'll note there is that in Australia, we have a much sharper decrease in, um, in labour force participation in the dark blue um, during both the Q2 2020 lockdown and the Q3 2021 lockdown. But what you'll notice is it's even deeper in New South Wales. So there's even bigger impact relative between men and women um, during the, particularly the 2021 lockdown. Now, there are a range of things that impact that. And there's international research and research that our team's doing that suggests that a range of other intersections impact. So age is one clear issue, and young women have been, um, as I said before, have been most profoundly impacted by job loss, um, uh, particularly because of the sectors in which they work. We also know that the sector that um, people are working in, particularly those really contemporaneous customer-facing uh, sectors, have been profoundly impacted, but also workers working on... Um, precarious contracts have been uh, really profoundly affected. Motherhood globally has come out as a real risk factor for people reducing labour force participation um, and for it being a risk in terms of um, capacity to earn and capacity to earn at the level that they did prior to the pandemic. But I thought on the themes, particularly the um, session that Peter just chaired, um, that you might be interested in this one. In Australia, as globally, geography and locality is really coming out as a significant uh, factor where we see lots of difference between what's going on with different types of women. Now, this is a graph, which you won't be able to read, but which tells you about the variegations in women's labour force participation rates across the different parts of Greater Sydney. Um, so the darker the blue, the higher the labour force participation, and you'll notice the inner Sydney uh, and the inner west are quite high. And then if you look at Central Coast uh, and uh, South West Sydney, you get down to lower levels, closer to 50%. So we thought that's interesting. That's actually on the most, uh, the latest available data from the ABS. And I thought I would just dig into, okay, let's compare Greater Sydney with uh, South West. And so this just gives you tracks along across that period where women are being whiplashed. Um, this is women's labour force participation at the top line, Greater Sydney. At the bottom line, this is South West Sydney. So you can see that participation was lower to start with in South West Sydney for women. Um, but you'll also notice that there is a much deep, deeper trough um, in, the, in the most recent um, period. Um, and you'll notice that those women, as compared to women of Greater Sydney, who seem to have returned, um, in almost the same rates, not quite, but almost the same rates as if we look at the end of 2019, that it's, that return is not happening. So that is a really big issue that I think we need to add in with the conversation that uh, the panel uh, just now is having. Okay, so what do we do about this? This is kind of me trying to return to something positive. What do we do about this? And I think there is a significant amount of opportunity that is available to us. Um, I was, as I said, so heartened to hear uh, Minister Keane talking this morning about um, the need to, um, to concentrate on women's participation, not just for a social um, reason, but because of an economic reason. Um, and for me, sitting down and thinking about what would be some principles that should guide the work of people in this room, um, our governments, um, business. Um, we do some work with the OECD and other multilaterals in my research team. What would go across all of those different interest groups to help us to try to build a foundation that is going to um, put us in a better place at the end of 2022? The first thing I would say is that we actually need to have a gender lens on the recovery. So we can't pretend that men's experience and women's experience is the same across the board in the labour market, it so clearly is not. Um, but it also is not in the context of shocks like this recent pandemic. 
Um, and we also need to have in that a sense of the variegations between women's experiences. So not all women have had the same experience of the pandemic. Um, women like me who've been able to work at home on Zoom have been driven quite mad by having children at home and having non-stop Zooms, but that's very different to the essential workers who've had to travel a very great distance um, to expose themselves to the virus, uh, to have also have their children at home in a lot of cases. Um, that's a really different experience. Um, we need to understand those variegations. Another thing that I think we should be looking at is perhaps one of the things that's a small glimmer of hope that's come out of uh, the pandemic, which is the capacity for some people who want to do so and can in their job to work on a, on a flexible basis, perhaps with a little more remote in there. There might be some colleagues here who don't necessarily think that's such a fabulous idea, not, not coming into the CBD all the time. But our focus groups with women, particularly some that I was running last week with women of the southwest of Sydney, suggests that um, there is a lot of tiredness with that commute. Um, and there's a lot of demand from young women in particular to be able to combine coming and being present at work with being able to work at least some of the time um, from home to give them some flexibility, some control and, and a range of other um, positives in their life uh, relating to care, among other things. We need to be looking at the ways in which we can create secure jobs on the front line. So I don't think it's good enough that what we did was rely on that really highly feminised front line during the COVID period and yet say that it's OK that women who work in areas like early childhood education and care and aged care and even in education um, more broadly, um, that they should be earning the wages that they're earning. Um, actually, one of the quickest things that we could do to fix the gender pay gap would be to bump up the wages in those sectors. It would also solve some of the labour supply issues. Uh, we need to be looking at the ways in which we can put together uh, work regimes with care regimes and stop pretending that they're separate. All of us are humans. We have a work life, we have a family life, and we need to try to find a way that we can put those things together to make it work for us as human beings. That ultimately is going to benefit employees, but it's also going to benefit business. And there's a lot of evidence that mutually beneficial and mutually supportive work and care regimes benefit us all. Probably a little bit of a bold statement here, but we need to pay women properly. Um, women for the last generation have sh voted with their feet in um, participating in higher education, participating in vocational education and training in the way that they've been asked to by business and by government. We need to pay back on that investment and we need to do it pretty quickly. Now is a good moment to do that. And then I think, um, given all of the um, conversations we've been having in recent times about the epidemic of disrespect, that we've seen in our workplaces. We need to stand up as leaders and take strong action in that area, and we need to create decent, respectful uh, work cultures. So for me, um, if I were thinking about how to make 2022 a better year, I think those things are a great foundation to start with. In good news, that will lead to a thriving workforce, particularly a thriving female workforce, but I think it's also going to get at something that's going to work for all of us, men and women, uh, business, um, and oh, women's advocacy groups, and that is to build a powerhouse economy that is thriving um, and that meets all of our needs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. Now, um, Slido, can we pop up the Slido login information? This is a question without notice for a fantastic team up the back. Um, so we've got some questions coming through, and I've got a 1,000. I could talk to you about this topic forever. Um, but I would love to hear, if you've got questions from the audience, um, please send them up, and I will do a brilliant job, hopefully, at dexterously <laughs> thinking and reading and turning them into questions. Um, so, Ray, thank you so much. Can we start with... Minister Keane is no longer with us um, this morning, but if he were, uh, what, what would you... And So, delighted to see his announcement this morning. I was and, and you were. What should he do first? That's a great question. <laughs> um, well, he should look at my final slide and look at the <laughs> principles that we should uh, start with in, in trying to uh, think about recovery with a gendered lens. Um, and a broad point, and then I'll go to a narrow one, mm. if that's OK. So first of all, I think we need to have a gender lens. And that means trying to, as I said, understand 
the different ways that this has played out for men and women and the different ways that the, the working life experience uh, plays out for men and women. But it also means having gender disaggregated data at the table and actually women at the table when we're talking about um, strategies to recover, uh, investments we're making as governments or businesses, um, to think about what's the gendered impact of this. So I think broadly that would be what I'd say to sort of guide the work. Um, in a more um, narrow focus, I suppose, I would say I think probably the biggest bang and the quickest thing that we could do to fix some of these problems is to work on trying to fix the issues that we have in early childhood education and care. So we have some really strong challenges there in terms of uh, affordable, accessible and high quality childcare. Um, I think most um, people who have, have or have had young, young children know that it's a, it's a really big struggle and it's very stressful for working families to be able to try to access the care that they need. Um, so we need to find ways to deliver that to families. Um, now, there are some challenges there in that the New South Wales government doesn't necessarily um, regulate all of the work that goes on in that area and there's you know, a bit of slippage between federal and state governments. But I would encourage the Treasurer to find ways to, to work out how the, the state can try to influence that. And there's a number of things um, that they could do around that whether it's um, looking at workforce supply issues, whether it's looking at the wages that are paid in those sectors um, and making, uh, things, m making those care services more accessible to families where they're needed and when they're needed. So can I pick up on your point at, at the beginning there about uh, information about the, the difference in experience of, of the genders and you um, said in your, sort of towards the end of your presentation, maybe this isn't a popular thing to say in this audience, but there's w women don't necessarily want to be back in the workforce, or um, back in the workforce, they want to be in the workforce, they do, they do yes. not necessarily want to want be to in be the, the CVD every yeah. day. Yeah. Um, and, and, so, and, and so, I absolutely feel and understand that, and I think it's a really important um, things for business leaders, and it's attention. So, it so at the committee, and certainly as a leader in my organisation, I want people to be together and thriving, and, and our culture to be, um, you know, we've had two years of not being able to be together. Yeah. But because I'm helps to be, sometimes be a woman, understand how women think. I absolutely understand. I won't be in our office five days a week like I used to be. I don't need to be. You can get a work a workforce going in a work a workplace. Um, going without that. I, I'd just love, while you've got a bit of a captive audience of leaders who will all be making this decision, I'd love you to expand on that a little mm. bit. So what is the experience of the women that you've worked with, surveyed and understand during the pandemic and, and what sort of experience of flexibility, what sort of a difference would that make? Yeah. Okay, so the women who are, when we've been talking to them in focus groups just last week actually, um, are telling us that what they want is not to work at home all of the time. In fact, there's almost nobody who wants to do that. Yes. Um, but they do want to have the capacity to have the choice about whether they might do that some of the time. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of demand um, from work, the workforce, and not just women, actually. I think there's a lot of uh, men who are also have had their very first experiences of being able to work remotely, who want to um, you know, multiply that uh, in the coming couple of years. Um, so they have a sense that it is possible to, to work that way. They have a sense that their employer is open to that. And in fact, they're expecting that you're going to be doing that. So I think it's less about me giving you advice about uh, what I think, but more telling you what uh, women, particularly, mm -hmm. I'm particularly thinking of young professional women here, um, telling us that it's, um, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not going to be a big hassle for their employer mm -hmm. to be able to provide them with the option to be able to work at home two days a week. So I think start thinking about that now and I think start actually talking to your workforce about what they want and what they need. Mm -hmm. Also, don't assume it's only uh, women who want mm -hmm. to do that. Um, I think there's a big unmet demand uh, among um, men, not just young men, but particularly young men who have a really different attitude towards flexibility to perhaps their father's generation. Mm -hmm. Um, some of that relates to care and actually wanting to spend a little more time with little ones. But a lot of it also relates to things like productivity yeah. um, and wanting to have that focused time to be at home. So I would say there, it, there is going to be a boom in demand mm. for uh, remote working, mm. but we have to be careful in the way that we design it as well. So what we don't want is a situation where we have 
men flocking back into the office and women being at home working on the Zoom all day because that could actually create some very significant challenges which might actually amplify some of these problems. We know that being present at work, being around for the sort of happenstance meeting can be really, um, really, really important. Um, so I think designing, designing that so that all of us have access to the, f the same types of flexibility and trying not to entrench some of those those challenges. And also holding back the deep desire to spreadsheet your way into flexibility stardom. So <laughs> I've, I've, I'm sure others have experienced the, the opportunity of working out who's going to come in what days and you end up in this horrifying spreadsheet yeah. that you almost need an algorithm uh, and, and that's actually the very definition of not flexibility. So it yeah. is a real challenge but I hear you that it's worth investing in. Yeah. Um, so I've got a root cause question. Um, so you talked about respect in the workplace, and it's certainly been a huge topic, um, very broad discussion, particularly particularly raised by young women. So I was at the 1991 end of the um, of the university graph there, and 20 years on, um, there's certainly a social movement that we've all yeah. experienced. Well, um, the last couple of years, can you have respect in the workplace without the underlying social and community respect for women? Are those two things? connected and can you can you sort of do one without the other? Great question. They're so connected. Um, you know, the social drives, the workplace, so much, you know, so connected. But on the other hand, I think we often let ourselves off the hook about mm -hmm. the extent to which the workplace is really important. Uh, a lot of the scholarship in my area actually suggests that workplaces, um, they create and they can amplify inequalities. Or they can help and they can assist in um, you know, undermining inequalities. So they're absolutely connected, um, but, I th but I think we, we abs the, the workplace is a key site where these things are playing out, um, and I think we need to really have strategies in place, not to make excuses, if you like, to say it's going on out there, there's all of, there's, you know, it's all of the people, uh, and they just happen to work in our, in our businesses. Yeah. yeah. So... Um Question about, oh, I've got so many good ones here. Um, question about pol workplace policies then. Yeah. So um, it, you talked about caring responsibilities at home and we all understand that you saw during the pandemic, men were definitely at home participating yeah, in the in family more. life yeah, and loved more. it and yeah. it's brilliant and we've heard that certainly through our organisation. Um, how important are policies for men to be able to stay home and take some of the sharing responsibilities, both from a parental leave perspective and a longer term flexibility. How much does that matter? Is that sort of tokenism around the side? Yeah, in a really non-academic way, I'm gonna say it matters so much. <laughs> um, so having policies that are not designed for one gender or the other is really critical. So actually mainstreaming access to high quality flexibility is probably one of the most important things that you can do this year. Um, making sure that your parental leave and your other forms of uh, leave for care are available to um, mothers as well as for non-birthing um, partners is just absolutely, completely critical. Um, and I think um, not a sh also looking at not just the policies, because we know that even in organisations that have fantastic policies around things such as you know, shared parenting or equal access to flexibility, that sometimes those norms that operate in the workplace make it impossible for men to access them. Mm -hmm. So we know, depressingly, um, that men are both less likely to ask for flexible working arrangements, particularly to care for children, than are women, but we also know that men are much more likely to be punished if they ask, and they learn a lesson from that. Um, so we need to look at what are the, not so much just the policies that are written down by HR, but what are the practices of leaders? Mm. Um, what are the ways that we encourage or discourage particular types of behaviour? And what do leaders themselves actually do to role model behaviour, particularly male leaders? So mm. what are you doing to show your male, um, you know, reports um, that it's OK to leave a little bit early, that it's actually really important that you spend time, um, you know, at, at the school with your kids if you want to do that, um, that it's not just something that we allow the women to slip out and do. Mm. Um, so it's both policies, which are so important, um, and making sure that they are mainstreamed and are available to everybody, but also not just in a, you know, letter of the 
letter of the policy, mm. uh, but actually in the practice mm. uh, of how we operate our businesses. And we'll, yeah. I can't remember which speaker. One of our speakers earlier was talking about the importance of language. In this particular, I think yeah. language really matters. I, we really try and talk about parental leave, and it doesn't roll off the tongue. Yeah. In my head, I took maternity leave, but even just using language really does, I, I think, make it seem more of an accessible, uh, yeah. acceptable. So it's one of those areas that I think language really matters. Absolutely, I totally agree, yeah. Uh, so last question, it's quite a specific, uh, it's a specific policy one, but it's the thing you said Minister Keane should start with childcare. So we've had a number of, a, a couple of questions and a couple of thumbs up. So we've got more space in our, uh, arguably, although if you're gonna let everyone come in between Tuesday and Thursday, you probably don't have a lot less space in your um, office buildings than you had before, um, but if theoretically there are more spaces in office buildings, is that a good place for childcare? Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Do that. That's a great idea. Um, I mean, uh, yes, we need, as I said, we need childcare when it's needed, and I think we need to have a bit of a look at how flexible childcare is. Um, not everybody works uh, nine to five. In fact, many of us work a hell of a lot longer than that um, and work kind of odd chunks of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and people who work in a different way that's not the nine to five assumption find it really hard to get childcare, whether they're shift workers or, you know, it's people who work different, different ways. Um, so we need to look at flexibility, um, but we also need to look at supply and availability where it's needed. Um, so whether that's close to home um, and, you know, within a, you know, certain parameters from home or whether that's close to work. Um, because we know it's interesting, um, I know there's colleagues from SGS here and they've done some really interesting work on what they call spatial tethering. Um, and there's a, seems to be quite a difference between how far men uh, in traditional relationships uh, will um, work away from family and how far women will work away from family. Um, and so actually the closer you can have childcare availability to the, the place, particularly where mothers are, okay. um, it's, re it's really important for them being able to leverage their labour force participation, work more hours and work in a better job. That's really interesting. Yes. So, thank you so much. I know when, I, um, when we at the committee speak to our members, one of the most um, important topics or highly relevant topics um, that we're discussing at the moment are firstly, how, what, what are we gonna do with people coming back to the office? And secondly, how do we build in hybrid working or more flexibility. And so to have real in-depth research um, that can support our decision making really helps. So we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks Thank for you the very much, Ray. Thank you. Thanks.